thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, you know, when I came, this is my first time down at South by Southwest. Woo! And uh, Nas was coming down and he came here last year and he was coming down here anyway. And I said, Nas, you know what? I think it'd be very important for us to, let's take today, it's Friday, let's have a conversation. Um, and let's show a side of our personalities and our relationship that people have not seen before. And uh, let's put it on stage. And he was cool with that. And I said, and then let's go a little party after that because, you know, we should celebrate the fact that our relationship in 17 years and bringing everybody together and, and yeah. we were cool with that. So I thank you. Your book, The Tanning of America, is out. And we know that tanning is basically when you see hip hop culture influencing mainstream, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. When you see, you know, hip hop culture, wherever it is around the world, when you see hip hop culture, bringing people together, no matter where they come from, no matter what ethnicity, but the culture is the connective tissue. Mm. That's the tanning effect. And that's what we're here, you know, celebrating tonight, you know, just coming down here to South by Southwest. What was important to me was just to have this moment with Nas. You know, we've known each other for 17 years, worked for each other for most of our careers, and to go on stage and to have very open dialogue about, and transparency about some of the things that we've done and witnessed, and, the way we've seen music change from hip hop music to what digital has done to music and share that in front of people was a special moment today. So I'm happy about the outcome. As I say, that hip hop culture has done more for bringing people together than anything since Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah, yeah. And I really mean that. Yes, sir. How have you guys seen tanning here at South by Southwest? I've been tanning at South by Well, I could say that I was here last year and um, this year there's a more, there's a lot more diversity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more of hip hop. Mm -hmm. So you know what's happening with South by Southwest is be it's becoming bigger by um, including a lot of acts that you never heard of before from the hip hop community, and that that alone makes it yeah. tanned. When you start seeing the amount of hip hop and rock music in such close proximity, exactly. playing next to each other and back to back, you gotta know you're gonna get different audience and different people coming from different cultures and you're gonna have cultural sharing. Yeah. So I just feel like it's appropriate. It's not even a big deal. Right. You know, it's a big deal to teach people that who don't know that this exists. Yeah. But for us, you know, and for a generation, it just is what we are and what we believe in. So it's just cool to see it happen, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Actually, his book is a, it's a real cohesive, thing because the tanning has been going on for so long mm. but no one was able to to put it in words call it what it is so that everyone could understand what's happening my start my career in the music business came uh from Knox, and he gave me a shot and uh, let me be his manager back in 95 and we went on to do some great things together and you know like everything else you do in life you take the momentum and you hopefully turn it into something else. And that's what we did, and that's what he did, and that's what has us here today. What were some of the challenges that you faced when you were trying to get Nas brand partnerships oh my and stuff God. like that back no, in the day? No, well, you know what it is? Nas was not a brand partnership guy, and he isn't. Mm. I say it all the time. Nas, you know, every time it goes to a point where he wants to, or what people want him to do, he goes left. He's an artist, so that's fine. But as it relates to just, the steps that it took trying to get mainstream to understand, even after we sold three million records when it was written and, you know, beat a bunch of records and did a bunch of things, it was still hard to get into a room because they just thought it was a trend. It wasn't going to matter. It wasn't going to last. So, you know, it wasn't one artist who did it. It was a bunch of artists. It was a hip hop culture that came together that galvanized and then pushed and broke that door open so that everything could happen. Everybody plays a part. But it was always hard, yeah. you know. Getting a big record was only, you know, okay, that's par for the course. That wasn't necessarily saying that mainstream America, they bought the record, but it doesn't mean they bought the dialogue, they bought the clothing, they bought the cultural influence. And it took a long time for everybody to accept that that was really going on. We, 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 uh, he told me I was, I was finishing my first album. It was done. I was getting in a lot of trouble, hanging with the wrong people. And this guy comes to the projects by himself, he, 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 you know, looking for me. And no one knows who he is. And 
they think he's coming to get me. Like he's some big drug dealer from Jamaica, Queens, is coming to get me. Because he's walking out there by himself and without a care. And when I heard about that, I said, I got I to gotta give this guy. He has some heart. And not just heart to say I can, say I can go through a, a tough neighborhood, but he, had, he, he saw something in me that he wanted to help, you know, blossom. And when we worked together, he sat with me and he said, man, he said, you, you got too much love for things and people who don't have no love for you. When are you going to take care of you? And it, it just it rung in my head and I saw that he was serious and we started to work together. So we, we got together, put a, a plan together and we did everything we intended to do. And at that point, it was way too big. We were, um, and he would get pissed at me because he had all these great plans for me to become even bigger, and it scared the shit out of me. I went home. I didn't want no parts of that. I was good enough. We had done things. I'm like, this is enough. He's like, what? We got this, this, this. We're going to keep killing everybody. Scared the shit out of me. So he said, all right, peace, now. Nice. He went off and became what he wanted to be and that is a, a brilliant businessman who was a, a tastemaker someone who was able to connect the dots in different worlds of business corporate world so-called urban world whatever that means and put them together for great reasons and do great things so i appreciate let's, that let's ask you a question okay <laughs> How does it, were you scared? Were you scared because you've been there with, you know, a lot of things, Tommy Matola is the, um, a lot of, a lot of different, a lot of things you've been involved in, in the music scene. Yeah. Big things, all kinds of things. So how, were you scared when you, when did you decide that you were going to leave the music industry? Because I remember you telling me, fuck the music industry. And I also, um, <laughs> Were you scared? It's not the kind of room that he's supposed to say fuck the music. You're here to see now the Steve Stout. This is the kind of room where I can say fuck the industry. Yeah. But I'll take that word out. So you were like, forget the industry. Yeah. I'm out of here. This is bull. This is bull. So. What made you say that, and were you scared to leave something that was working for you to go to something different? So what made me leave the record industry was the executives did not know the difference between what was good and what was garbage. And I can, assu I can assume that you were going through that as an artist. When artists who are not as talented or executives who are not as talented are getting big deals and getting all these things and bragging about it and i'm saying but why them is it because it's new that's the same thing like a ponzi scheme at some point it runs out right somebody's gonna get caught hold in a bag and you know i didn't want to be around when that took place and i felt like you know if i use the momentum that i had as an executive and took it to another field, I could, you know, trade on some of the things that I've learned uh, in the music business and apply that to a to another industry. Um, and you know, was I scared? I was very scared, but I was also very unhappy. And you know, at 29 years old, I remember, you know, I had you know made a lot of money, and I was still broken up inside because. I felt like I wasn't fulfilling my purpose. I was just making money. And, um, and that's when I decided to go into the advertising business. And I, I tell people, you know, not to be very specific, but I will tell you that if I was making $20 a year in the record business, when I went into the advertising business, I accepted to make $1. And people would look at me like I was crazy, but I felt satisfied in making that that switch because i felt like i had a it was just something i could 
fulfill you know what I was about and what I stood for. So that that's the reason why I did it. And that fair, I mean, how you deal with fair in whatever you do for a living is going to determine the outcome. If you don't have fair in what you're doing, it's probably something that's too easy for you to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So there has to be some level of tension in order to rise above. And you know, some people look at that and it's a daunting thing, and they turn away from it. And I ain't dealing with that. And some people look at that and say, I'm, I got this. I'm gonna. I'm going to, you know, achieve that obstacle. So when I asked you earlier, um, first of all, uh, you know. Do you think that the fact that now people can buy singles and um, there's a lot of reward systems set up for selling singles, that the rap artist, the art form was always based off your album. Do you think that because singles are selling, and people are buying records and singles, that it's causing albums to not be as good as they should be because there's no reward system for albums. It's all based on the singles now. Yeah, but that's that's um, um, that's just something we gotta live with. Everything changes. Like I felt like it's it's hit a, a rebuke, or uh, what's it called, reboot, reboot yeah. button. Mm -hmm. I felt like it's starting all over again. So in the beginning of um, the record business, it was a singles business. And when, when hip hop started to get major deals, um, not a lot of rap records were, buy, uh, were selling. They were your main groups that were selling, and the rest were just single people. I think today, it's like that again. You have certain artists that you buy for that album. You know that this person, like a Kanye West, you want to hear, you know his singles could be big and sell lots of records, but you want to hear his album. You know what I'm saying? If Lauryn Hill dropped the album today, it, you know what I'm saying? We'd be into it. it how about, about new artists? But how about new artists? Kanye's been around for 10 years now. New artists are a part of the thing that happened in the beginning of rappers first being signed. It was a, it was, to me, it was like a singles business. It was like you get a single deal. There was, used to be single deals. Mm -hmm. And then that went away. Now it was album deals, signed for five albums. And it's back to single deals again. So these guys are a part of the cycle, and, mm -hmm. and they're coming into the business as a part of that cycle. I don't take nothing away from them. They just are not album artists, and I can't give them too much credit either because they're not. Album. I, I listen to albums, but mm -hmm. it's, I don't think it's really their fault. Okay. How has being a father of two children changed your music? I'll say, man, when my daughter was born, I, it scared me, man, because I, I was just starting to talk trash and crazy stuff. I was just getting loose. I, I had so many more bitches to say, you know. I, I was just starting to really wrap around these words, and, you know, um, and here she comes. And um, I, I, I was like nervous to that. I think I'd be embarrassed that she would hear me talking like that. You know what I'm saying? So it definitely changed. It toned my thing down, and maybe, and not only musically, but you know, in life, my life, I was it calmed me down. It kept me out of the street. I thought like I have to be here for somebody else. Like I can't be going through. Uh, yeah. Hanging with the wrong crowds, you know, all the stuff you do in the beginning of, mm -hmm. when you're young, you know. So it made me grow up. Yeah. It affected the music big time. I know I have a very funny story with Nas. I figured we can go this back and forth, but let me just interject because of that history. Is so many. He's Nas is not the artist who's ever gives much of himself in interviews. So for him to take the time to do this today. Feel comfortable to do this with me is a very special thing. Uh, in talking about this period, we were at a hotel one time. We were getting ready for a show, and Nas, Nas always felt like there were guys that were going to be after us. Right? By the way, not me, us. Right? <laughs> so Nas told this guy, "Go back to Queens and go get the iron." <laughs> Like, yo, we're gonna have a problem, go get the iron. 
the guy really comes back with an iron. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what are we going to do about this? <laughs> I remember that bad, bad uh, that guy's, guy's real dumb. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, it was, it was a different period, man. You know, me and Steve. Um, and, uh, and back to um, the groups I was talking about that came out in the 80s, they were the greatest in the world, but the record, the record sales were not where they, I felt like they should have been. When, I, when we got into the game, things started changing, and um, we figured it out. And... Um, the record sales were there, and it, it you know, it, it raises, you know, the, the wolves smell it, and, you know, it was, we were, I still was in the street, and Steve was uh, just thinking, you know, we can do anything, we're going to do anything, we're, we're, the, we're the greatest, and, uh, but then, you know, we just had to be careful, you know, it was a serious time during the New York, New York, in that time where they weren't used to seeing platinum artists. It was new. A, a New York platinum artist. That yeah. was a new thing. I think, I mean, you were the first one. No. Who was the first was one? Biggie. I mean, I mean, like, as far as, like, setting off a platinum selling career. Okay. You know, not the first one to sell, because, you know, Cool J, Run DMC, all those guys were mm -hmm. platinum. During our time, uh... It kind of, the sales were slowing down for some of those guys. And it, it looked like what we were about to represent was just a street underground thing. It seemed a little too dangerous, more dangerous than the Cool Jays and the groups that came in. When Biggie represented Brooklyn, it was Brooklyn. When I represented Queensbridge, it was serious. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot more street element coming with this. It was, you know what I mean? It was, it was anti-Hollywood. It was... It, it was. It, it came from a street perspective. All the way. Do me a favor. Can, tell everybody about your relationship with Tupac. Tell everybody about, you know, the the confrontations, the conversations that you had with Tupac. Let's speak specifically about the night at the MTV Awards in New York City. Oh man, that night. That night was. Um, it was crazy that time because. His Machiavelli album, his last album, was there was all this buzz about it, all this talk that Tupac's coming from New York, and um, Tupac is the biggest guy in the game, and you know we all loved him, and he was coming from New York. So long story short, he's in New York, Death Row's in New York, and um, there was no one really around from New York that represented. In New York at the time, like physically, during that time and at, at, at that party. So, what do you mean, like? I mean, no. It was, you know, I think a, a lot of people don't know. It's not widely known, um, you know, the relationship that New York artists had with him, with, with Tupac and um, the respect, the mutual level of respect. Because a lot of people, if you just read the headlines, all you've seen was that everyone hated each other but not that the artist had that mutual respect. It seems like there's a lot of respect given to Tupac from East Coast artists after his death. But no one talks about the respect that they had for his creativity and art and the mutual level of that. They only think about he hated New York as well. That's what I wanted you to, to allude to. Oh, uh, man, yeah. I mean, Pac's one of my favorite art artists. And when we saw each other, we had saw each other before that, but when we saw each other, I, you know, I felt like I'm mean, he's in my city. I gotta step to this guy, so we stepped to Death Row in uh, um, one of those parks out there, and uh, really just got to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. Really got to the bottom of it too. And what he said to me is, "Me and you are brothers. We're not supposed to. Me and you are never supposed to go at it." But I heard you were dissing me on mixtapes. I'm like, I heard you dissing me on this new Machiavelli album. And you were there, you know how we could, uh, none of us could be sitting here, me or you right yeah. now, because it was, it was very, a very dangerous situation right there. And um, greater heads 
Cavell, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, we both knew that there was, we were supposed to continue that conversation mm -hmm. and probably even squash the whole thing, but I was scheduled to meet him in Vegas. Yeah. And uh, you guys, you and Jimmy Ivan called me about four in the morning and told me that um, he might not make it. It's touchy to talk on that because he's not here and, and with all respect to his legacy, you know, but it, it was a, a moment. Um, it was a moment. So you've been in the game now uh, for... Uh, uh, as a career person, how do you play to the shifting landscape and adapt to it? You know, you still want to be yourself, but at the same time, you don't want to date yourself and not be able to adapt to that shifting landscape. As an artist who has to be on the forefront of culture, how did you deal with that? Man, it was rough. It was like, it was really rough. Because and then on top of all that, you got Puffy in the game. <laughs> and he's moving everything around yeah. fast. Yeah, he's, he's on fire. He was, he, <clears throat> yeah, um, I mean, nothing should be, like you said, if, if, it's, if it's too easy, it ain't even worth it for you. I like a challenge. Mm -hmm. And challenge for me, it, without that, you know, I, I don't, I'm not interested no more. There's no challenge in it. I'm not, I'm not interested no more. But, you know, I did records um, while it was becoming all these different things. I was doing different things. You know, while I was becoming commercially successful all around the world, hip-hop music all around the world, I felt safe that I could do whatever I wanted to do and I'll be okay because hip-hop as a whole is becoming bigger and bigger. Even if I'm not at the forefront, I felt safe within this community of hip-hop that I would, as long as the hip-hop culture was growing and growing, not, not really the, the roots of the culture, but just what hip-hop hip as a whole was growing and growing, I'm a part of that. So I always felt a part of it, no matter how far it goes. It's a tough question. Tough question. Do you have, out of all the music you made on my albums, a favorite song that you made? Mm -hmm. I, no, no, but I have, I, I do like New York State of Mind. I do like probably some of the not so popular ones that I made, but I like Rewind, I like Gave You Power, I like, um, Ghetto Prisoners Rise. I like the songs that didn't see light, light of day. You look back and say, oh shit, I wrote that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do, I, I really do. <laughs> I think we all do, we all do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. Outside of yourself, is there a favorite rap artist, somebody you listen to, that you, you like listening to, that you listen, you find yourself listening to often? I find conviction, honesty, and great storytelling in Scarface. I find that a lot of my 80s guys really had depth and Yeah, I'm kind of stuck with those guys, even though I like, I listen to everything going on today. Um, but those guys back then were raw. Anybody in particular, your favorite from back then? You're like, wow, this is, this guy was way ahead of his time. This is, it still works to this day. It didn't date itself. When, when I hear that. Yeah, right record, now, yeah. <clears throat> um. Uh, yeah, there's, there's Eric B. and Rakim. And then, um, Slick Rick. Slick Rick. Slick Rick. He was the biggest honor I could ask for. Because Rakim to me was <clears throat> the greatest, you know, of, of that era, especially, you know. So to get, and I, most people felt the same way. Mm -hmm. So. To get compared to Rakim is crazy. You know, it's my first record and they compared me to him. And um, it only got, I only stopped liking it when I was doing, 
when there was things, um, you know, you grow all the time. You yeah. Know, you always grow, and, and the people were still hanging on to that. And I'm like, I'm doing this and doing that and doing that. And they were still holding on to it and not seeing what else I was doing. You know so they mean? wouldn't let you evolve as an artist because they wanted to put you in the Rock Kim box like that. Those topics, those things, is it, yeah, was it that kind I, of pressure? I call them fanagers. Fanagers? Yeah, they're like fans, but they, 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 they're micromanaging your career. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. A little of the, the errors that I like, the sound, circa 90s and stuff. Uh, like Nasty was like 90s kind of vibe. So it was, that's woven in there. And um, there's some, some personal stuff, you know, other life stuff in there. So I try, to, I try to put that out there, get that off my chest. Yeah. When is this out? Um, June. June, end of May, June, beginning of June. There was a report, and just if it's true, you can, you can say no comment, about a group or an idea of you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, will not, there will be no more firm type albums not performed with other I, artists. I can't say that. Okay. But if you're talking about there's a recent rumor. Yeah, a recent rumor. No, nah, that's not true. Okay. Has anything, has digital technology at all affected your music? Have you done anything different? Do you feel anything about the technology aspect of what's happening right now and, and how you're releasing records or what you think about that? Do you consider it at all? Yeah, because um, it affected all of the big uh, record companies. It affected them big time. And of course that affects the artists and things change again, things change and it's it's all about what we're willing to accept from the new technology. A lot of us want to hold on to the old ways. Um, you got things like Spotify now that's, could, you know, could be a competition, it was competition for iTunes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you, you, it's a whole different world. And I'm not, I'm not scared of it. I think that is a good thing. I think old things, it's just nature. You know, things change. So even though um, it became a singles business again at the, at the height of album artists, it became a singles business and threw everybody off. I think it just, it's just all a matter of time before everybody figures it out and figures out how to jump back in and, and do what they do. So I'm, I'm cool with it. Have you, um, we're down here at South by Southwest. I mean, this has just been, we've seen um, a lot of changes in the convergence of uh, rock music and hip hop music and those cultures coming together. Is there any collaborations with any rock artists or any uh, uh, rock music that, that, that you've seen in the foreseeable future? And that's playing a very important role in, in the way this new teenagers growing up and his musical choices and the sounds that he's listening to? Yeah, yeah, I would love that. You know, I like, um, you know, a few of the guys out there, Radiohead and um, White Stripes and um, Coldplay and um, they even caught up on some country, you know. It's, <laughs> it's all about, you know, meeting different people and talking about music in a different way that you talked about it for the first 10 years of your music career. You know, if you've got a lot of years in it, you want to try to experiment with different kind of sounds. So, it's nothing I've done yet, but I'm into it. Officially, you did leave altogether. But, I, 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 but I left the business still, of selling music. Right, right, right. Okay, so I'm still in the business of that consumer, but I left the business of selling music. Um, you know, I really, 
I gotta love the music is also, you know, and I, I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of music out right now that I don't love. I can say it. Um, and I can sell a lot of things, but I gotta have a, a heart for it. Um, I think if the artists start paying more attention to making great albums and stop trying to play towards radio and stop just playing for that like all the time. We'll find some more texture around the artist, and, and it's something that I I can find myself uh, getting back into. Okay. Uh, now, what's still as far as you make and create? You know, when you're at MC, that a lot of people feel almost has nothing to prove at this point. Your stature is solidified. What as far as you still be creative today? Well, as a big fan of hip hop music, I, I said this in another interview before, uh, before. I'm making the music that my heroes didn't. I feel like there's a side of the, the guys I grew up listening to, there was a point where they lost the love for it because a lot of them wouldn't open up. A lot of them had to be the star, the big rap star, but they never let you into their lives. They never really humanized themselves because they were so great at being these teachers and these genius musicians that they never did what, uh, say, a Marvin Gaye did, or, uh, you know, let, let people in. And I think that was a big loss for us fans because they didn't. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing what I never got from them at this point in my life. I want to take somebody, let me go way in the back, way in the back, again. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, with all the success you had throughout the years, like, what, uh, how do you stay so humble? You know, a lot of people sell a lot of records, make all the money, and you still seem like a very down-to-earth, grounded person. I was just curious of that. Um, you know what it was? I, I'll be honest, I think it was upbringing. Like, my, my, my mom was real humble, and, and my pop was crazy. So, you mix that up, you got me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at, I, I, I do see, I do hear that a lot, actually. And I don't think it's about me at the end of the day. I got, I was blessed with a talent, and sometimes it's a curse. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I just got to balance me, and I'm too busy doing that to really act funny. I see some of your newest guys turn not give an autograph to a kid and, or, or just really be, really feel himself. I've seen a lot of people in this business change and it makes me smile because I feel, I feel a little sorry for them. But I, it makes me smile because I know that they, they I, that I'm hoping for them. I'm smiling like they'll be okay. They'll be okay. I'm always just been straight up, regular, chilling. Yeah, this is crazy. <laughs> Somebody said one of the Honestly, I, I, don't, I don't, that's heavy, bro. Like, whatever they would want to do, I, 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 I don't really trip off of it. It's like, it's deep that you would even think I'm work, museum worthy. Like, I think of museums and I think of things from King Arthur that's sitting there and people like Shaka Zulu Spear. <laughs> Me, wow. Yeah, I can't even think that far. A man in the aisle, because you're in the aisle, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm Nas, um, nah, the album you did with Dan and Marley, I mean, I know it must have connected with the home, you know, fan base, yeah. the radio, so yeah. what was the vibe like from, you know, his, more his audience, as I'm sure he got a lot of your audience, but, you know, how did how that project, you know, make you look at it? It, it was, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that project. It was, um, it was really like uh, a spiritual thing, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm happy about that. Damien is one of the smartest people I've ever met and one of the most easiest going people I've ever met, you know? I, I'd be around Damien and I think I'm cool, like, you know, I might have a ring on, I might have this, sometimes my chains are crazy, sometimes not. But around him, I felt like taking it off. And no one's ever made me feel like that in touch with what's right. 
because that, and, and I, I felt I felt like even his father's presence a little bit around the project while we were working. Certain things we would do, certain shows would be pouring rain and outside when we hit the stage. The sun came out, and then when we left, it poured rain again. Like <laughs> things like that would blow me away. So I'll never forget that. You got pissed, and I never see you again. <laughs> I mean, by the way, I said it. Don't worry about it. I, I said it's all cool. <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> do you remember the studio session? Yeah, yeah, I do. Now, was I pissed? Well, you didn't come back. <laughs> I, it had nothing to do with Will, as you know. Will's yeah, of course. great friend. But it, um, it just, my work ethic was really not there. Even with my records. I work one day and then I'm gone. So, yeah. That was, uh, that was interesting. We worked, we worked doing some more stuff. No, we were doing a lot. No. His album? Yeah, we, well, it was the it was the big Willie Style album, and it was... Uh, Men in Black. Men in Black, Black, and it was all around the same time, and he yeah. really wanted you to write, you know, he wanted you to, he, he, was, he admired everything that you had done as a lyricist, and he wanted you to write his rhymes. It was, I was thinking about the publishing and the opportunities <laughs> that could come from that. You were. That's who I am, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hide from that. I, I hid from it for a minute. And you did. I didn't hide well, so. And I'm glad to see that you are who you are. Everywhere we are, everywhere we go, and we, see, and, and, uh, we hang out, it's great times. It's great, great times. Because uh, we went to we went two different journeys, and we're happy with who we are today. And we have so much history between each other. And I think about the things I didn't want to do and, and how it pissed you off. And you didn't understand it. And, you know, but we all get it now. The yeah. things you wanted to do that I didn't understand. Yeah. And, and we all get it now, you know. You know, it, and you look at Premier.